it warm, we was complaining about the sun, some of us, and Lord chill it off, we are complaining about the chill in the rain. Amen. That's just human nature, amen. We like to complain, don't we? God's good, though, amen. Despite it all, he's merciful to us, amen. He allowed us to see another night so far, amen. Be able to come to church and worship. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Uh, they're having a mission conference revival at uh, Victory Baptist Church in Salisbury. Where Brother Chris Sadler pastor. So uh, if you're interested in going tomorrow, see Aaron. Amen. He's going to try to carry a load up that way if you want to go. So that'll be tomorrow. Amen. Night. So if you're interested in going, please see him. He's the one on crutches. And him, Shay's up here with the foot boot on. I believe we both left foot. I think they was kicking each other late yesterday and broke both of them's foot. I don't know, amen. Y'all been kicking each other? Uh, she's just smiling, so I don't know, amen. She sat there and kicked her. She was standing there, amen. We've been looking in Genesis chapter 3 about the fall of man. We looked at the first six verses last time we was here studying the book of Genesis. And we saw man's sin described in these first six verses. Tonight we're going to look at verse 17 through 13 on man's shame because the fall which came in because of sin brought shame and then next we'll look at the last part of the chapter verse 14 through 24 on man's suffering. Sin brings shame and with the shame comes suffering, amen. Sin doesn't play fair. The devil doesn't play fair, amen. And we see how he interjected himself into mankind's life in the Garden of Eden and plummish this world in the sin and what we're dealing with today. And a lot of people want to blame the devil and blame man. But you know what? The truth be told, we all are guilty and are all are sinners before the Lord. Amen. And we need God's forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. We'll begin. We'll read verses 1 down through verse 13. And we'll look at verse 7 through 13 tonight. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. We saw when we looked at man's sin that the devil interjected doubt within the hearts and minds of God's people which led them into the decision that they made. He said, Yea, he's positive. The devil's always positive, amen. But he ain't going to show you the negative that's going to come in your life. You look at billboards today that show forth sin, everything's positive. They're drinking and smiling and dancing and having a good time. They don't show you the car wrecks and the cirrhosis of the liver and the heartbreaks of mamas and daddies and the busted marriages. He just shows you the positive. But there's a lot of negative that comes along with sin. He said, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden and she left out where God said you freely can the Bible said but of the fruit of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God have said you shall not eat of it neither shall you touch it lest you die God never said anything about touching it when you get to speaking bad about God you're gonna do everything you can to kind of bring it up to make God look like he's bad and boy we serve a good God Amen. the Bible said in verse 4 and the serpent said unto the woman you shall not surely die. Boy, he's a liar, ain't he? The Bible said he's the father of it. You shall not surely die. That's a lie. They ate and they died spiritually, and eventually they died physically. And if you mess around with this world and sin, it will kill you. Amen. You're going to die. The Bible said in verse 5, And God, for God doth know, here's what the devil said, that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know what? For the most part, the devil's pretty much right. Yeah, you go, your eyes will be open, but you ain't going to like what you see. But they were open, amen. Hey, you go, you're, you'll be God. You'll be your own God, and you're going to know good and evil, but you ain't going to like what you know. And the Bible said in verse 6, and when the woman saw, I was looking down there at uh, Evan tonight. He was reading his Bible. He's got some verses highlighted right there. I said, son, what are you doing? He said, reading. He, I said, what you got right there highlighted? He said, that's my favorite verse. You know what it was? 1 John 2, 15. He sat there and read it to me. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the light. You know, the same thing the devil did right there. That's a good verse for a young child to have as their favorite verse. This old world will kill you and the things of it. Amen. 
And she said, and, the, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, nothing wrong with that, right? And it was pleasant to the eyes, it looks good. And a tree to desire to be made one wise. Now, who wouldn't want that? It looks good, pleasant to my eyes, going to make me wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the Bible says in verse 7, where we'll start tonight, and the eyes of them both were open, just like the devil said, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They'd heard his voice many a times, but it was different this time. As the Bible said, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why would you want to hide from God? Up to this point, they had a good fellowship with the Lord, walked with him and enjoyed his fellowship. But at this moment, now that sin has entered in, they have taken of the forbidden fruit and disobeyed the word of God. Now they're hiding from God. And this is where the shame comes in. We're talking about man's shame tonight. Sin leads to shame. You know what you're going to do? You do wrong. You're going to go hide somewhere. You're going to try to cover it up. That's why men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Neither come they to the light. They don't like the light of God's word. They don't like the God, light of God's people that live right. They flee that thing and run away from it. Amen. You get under the cover of darkness and it seems like it's okay to sin. Most wickedness is done at nighttime. Under the cover of some disguise, like no, like God can't see through the dark skies. He sees in the dark just like he does in the light. Amen. There's no darkness in him at all. And the Bible said, And the Lord God called unto Adam, verse 9, and said unto him, Where art thou? It's a good question. You know what? God's still asking that question tonight. Amen. Where art thou? You say, I'm sitting in church tonight. God wants a little bit better answer than that. When he, God knew Adam was in the garden. He wanted Adam to realize where he was before the Lord. Where are you in God's eyes? Might look good in man's eyes. You know, we might look good amongst ourselves, but that ain't wise, is it? Verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Boy, a lot of people ain't afraid of that no more, are they? <laughs> and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God's not asking for information. He knows. He knew where he was. He knew where he had ate. They nothing caught God off guard. God just wanted Adam to own it. Where well, mankind has a problem today is owning their own sin. Verse 12, and the man said, the woman. There's the problem. Don't y'all amen that, man. <laughs> you get in trouble tonight. The woman, he not only blames the woman, look how deep he goes, he blames God. The Bible said, he said, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me. It's your fault, God. Boy, you get in bad shape before the Lord when you start blaming God. That's what people do today, they blame God. God, why'd you let this happen? Why do I get sick? Well, you better be careful. I just say there's nothing wrong with you talking to God about things and trying to get a little bit better understanding, but you better be careful blaming God like it's his fault. The woman that thou, whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that, Pay attention to every word, thou, just like he said Adam, this individual, it's you, has done. And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. It's the blame game. Passing the buck. Sin brings forth shame. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God for some help tonight as we look into his book and trust him to speak to our hearts. Brother Ted Mack, how about lead us to the Lord in prayer, brother? Pray for us. Yes, thank you for your goodness. Bless our study tonight, Lord. Help your people. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Bless them, help them. Yeah, 
Amen. It's very obvious in these first six verses that we see man's sin. Back in verse number six, the Bible said, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Still very common practice today that most of the time people like to do wicked with someone else. Maybe it kind of eases the conscience if someone else interjects themselves within the same sin you're doing. That's why birds of a feather flock together. We like to run with a crowd that does the same wickedness that we do. Amen, and surely we're not supposed to run to that same excess of riding after God saves us. When they ate and took of the fruit, which I believe to be the grape, they popped it within their mouths and some things happened. Uh, number one, we see that if you study the word of God, that they, beca they got blood poisoned. Something happened, whether mankind had blood blowing in the veins at this moment, it's kind of up to debate, but something happened to that blood, it became contaminated. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The reason why we die is very obvious. There's something wrong within the bloodstream of mankind. God made man to live forever. But man took of the forbidden fruit. He disobeyed the word of God and he was blood poisoned. Not only do we see that he was blood poisoned, they were blood poisoned. They also had their, their spirit died. God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God never lies. There was a death that took place. Their spirit died. That's why mankind today needs to be born again. He needs to be quickened by the Spirit of God. And you who are dead in trespasses and sin. Amen. God's speaking to individuals in this world today. They're dead without God. They've got a dead spirit. Man's made a body just like God formed him in the book of Genesis there. And he breathed into his nostrils. There's the Spirit of God. And man became a living soul. So man's body, soul, and spirit. When he took of the forbidden fruit, his spirit died, which eventually leading to his body dying and his soul leaving this body. And when a man's soul leaves the body, they either go to a heaven or to a devil's hell. Amen. But the spirit is dead. Amen. They ate of the forbidden fruit. They got blood poison. Their spirit died and their soul became stuck to their body of flesh. That's why when a man's born again in the, new birth, in the new birth, in the New Testament, that flesh is cut away spiritually, circumcised from his soul. Amen. There's, there's, a, there's a connection between the two today. And now your flesh dictates everything your life does. Amen. And you follow the flesh until you come to know the Lord as your Savior. Mostly, you know, and surely not leastly, man lost the image of God. God made Adam in God's image. In the image of God made he man. Amen. He formed him and made him in his image. And, but the uh, mistaken taught by many people today that all people are made in the image of God. Sounds pretty good outwardly. You know, God's a triune being, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Man has a body, soul, and a spirit. So in that sense, he is in the image of God. But when you take the word image and how it's portrayed out in the word of God to be made like God, we are not in the image of God. Adam was in the image of God. But when Adam sinned, his spirit died. His flesh connected to his soul. He lost the image of God. And now mankind is made in the image of fallen Adam. Sorry to bust your bubble tonight. We're not made in the image of God. Until the new birth comes, in whom the devil is blind to the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We never get the image back until you get the sun into your heart. Amen. And you don't fully get it back then until God transformed this body back in heaven and makes it like it should be in the beginning. Should have been. Man lost the image. But something else happened to man. God said, the devil said, and they, they you ate there, you should be as God's knowing good and evil, and their eyes shall be open. And when they ate of the fruit, the Bible said in verse number 7, their eyes of them were open. They knew that they were naked. Something happened to man in the fall when he took the forbidden fruit. His conscience became to be enlightened to this wicked world. Look with me in Romans chapter number 2. Hold your place in Genesis 3. Romans 2, look in the New Testament. Man, we're talking about man's shame tonight. His sin led to his shame. Amen, things that happened when he took of the forbidden fruit. And, and whether you want to admit it or not, you might can debate, you know, whether I don't believe man's got a blood problem and uh, I don't believe his spirit's dead and I, don't, I think we're all made in the image of God. You're going to have to admit to me tonight when we read this verse and look at this subject tonight that man has a consciousness that he is created by a creator which is God and you're accountable back to him. 
Romans chapter number 2, verse number 15. Amen. Romans 2 and 15, the Bible says this. What's the first word there? Let me get there and see if you're right. The Bible said in verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. The Bible says their conscience. You got a conscience? An enlightening factor within mankind? His conscience, the Bible says, listen to what your conscience does, also bearing witness. And their thoughts, the meanwhile, ex accusing or excusing one another. You know what happens when the conscience begins to enlighten you? It either excuses or accuses. Man has a conscience. As soon as man took of the forbidden fruit, he became conscious of his wrongdoing. That's why he sowed fig leaves and hid himself. Hey, the enlightenment took place and he realized something is wrong. Do you know up to this point he'd been naked all the time and it never bothered him? Matter of fact, there wasn't a thing wrong with him being naked at that time because he didn't have a conscience of, and wickedness and sin in his life. But now he's been enlightened and he looks down and he says, this ain't right. Hey, hey, you're born with a conscience, amen. That's the God-given factor in you to prove that there is a God in heaven. There's something inside of you that lets you know wrong and right. His conscience bears witness. He, he, the, uh, he, he soon partakes of the forbidden fruit and is conscious of his wrongdoings. He can see his fallen condition. The conscience bears witness to man's depravity and is also a work of the Creator's handiwork. The fact that you've got a conscience proves there is a Creator among other things in the Word of God. The conscience, think about it. The conscience surely wasn't made by man. It ain't made by your doings. Because if it was our doings, the conscience that we have, it wouldn't accuse us like it does. What shows you inside of you, what's inside of you saying, that ain't right. I've got no business looking at that. What tells you that when you look that way? What, what, what inside man lets him know that something's not right when he touches something he shouldn't touch? Or when he goes somewhere he shouldn't go. Why does he hide from it unless something inside of him is letting him know that thing is wrong? What happens in mankind today, this is why you see man over the far limit of this whole thing called sin. is because they sear their conscience. That the conscience is like a little box rolling around in your head. And every time something is wrong, it, it kicks the corner. It knocks the corner a little bit, and you say, man, that ain't right. It's accusing or ex excusing you, whether it be right or whether it be wrong. And the more you do wickedness, and the more you indulge in wickedness, and the more you knock the corners off the box, that's when you be your conscience becomes seared. Instead of a box turning up, there's a little severe, a ball just rolling around, and nothing catches. That's when people get so caught up in this old world and they turn their back on God and reject the word of God and the conscience that's trying to speak to them and the Holy Ghost trying to work through their conscience and they dive into the wickedness of this world and they just keep saying, no, it doesn't bother me. No, it doesn't bother me. And they know it's kicking. But eventually they kick all the corners off and they just unconsciously live like hell. How does the person get where they unconsciously just drink and indulge in, in pornography and wickedness and sin and indulge in fornication, indulge in drug and, and, and hellious living and killing others? Amen. There's something wrong with the conscience. Adam knew this ain't right. Well, you better thank God if you got something in you that lets you know something's not right. Man would not have made a conscience that accused him or judges him, amen, or even torments him sometimes. You better thank God something torments you. Hey, lost people, by the way, have a conscience. Lost people know something's not right. The conscience is the still small voice of God within the soul, testifying to the fact that man is not his own maker. You are made by something above you but responsible to a moral law which either approves or reproves his life. Amen? Sin brings shame. Sin brings guilt, what we'll see tonight in this passage. Guilt brings shame, and shame compels the sinner to run and hide. He indulges in his sin. He becomes guilty of his sin, 
The sin of his guilt brings shame to his life, and shame compels the sinner to run and hide. Numbers 33, 32 and 23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. Sooner or later, you're going to get caught. The guilt. Look in verse 7. The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they uh, were uh, uh, naked, and, so, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. It was a joint effort. They individually took of the fruit themselves. Adam, knowing what he was doing, partook of the fruit, took a death for his wife, and now they both work together, together to try to cover their sin. One of the first things people do is try to cover it up. Let's try to make sure it don't look that bad. They look down, saw this ain't right, but we got to hide it. That's what people do, they hide it. You know, you know what, young people start indulging in things, that's why they hide it. That's why they put passwords on the telephone so nobody else can see. That's why they hide it from others. That's why you make different accounts with different names. Because you shame, you know it ain't right. Why would you be hiding it? That, that's why they make uh, 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 telephones now with screens that unless you're looking dead at it, you can't see it if you're looking from the side. Why are you scared somebody's looking? You're looking at something that ain't right? Why you got to hide it? Why you need a password? What's there to be hid from? Hey, man, hey, sin, guilt, hey, man, is, try, is sin always be, try to be covered up. Look in, hold your brace in Genesis, always, of course. Look in Proverbs 28, look at the wisdom of Solomon. People like to hide their sin, cover it up, sweep it under the rug, you know, act like nothing never happened. Psalms, Proverbs 28, the Bible said in verse number 13, that would be a good verse to highlight and underline if you don't mind writing in your Bible. Surely we don't want to do harm to the scriptures and change anything God said. Just for a reference, it'd be good for you. Proverbs 28 and 13, the Bible said, He that covereth his sins shall not what? Prosper. You ain't going to get by. You try to cover up all you want to. Adam and Eve ain't going to get by. You ain't going to prosper. And you're not going to prosper. And I'm not going to prosper. But the Bible says, But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have what? Mercy. Instead of confessing and forsaking their sin, you know what Adam and Eve does? They sow fig leaves and cover it. You know what God said? You're not going to prosper. You're not going to prosper neither. Neither will I. No one in this world will prosper. They should have sought God and confessed their wrongdoing. That's how merciful God is. But you know what mankind does? He loves his self-righteousness. He loves his fig leaves, you know. Let's just make it, like, like it look like it. it's not really that bad. Let's cover it up. You know, let's try to downgrade our sin. Let's downgrade our disobedience, you know, because you know what? Everybody does it. It's a good way to downplay it, ain't it? Well, God knows I'm weak. That, that's a good way to cover it up. But we got all kinds of excuses, and we like to cover our sin, but God said you're not going to prosper. So we sow our self-righteous fig leaves. We make it look good outwardly, but God said, I know something's not right inwardly. And you can cover it up all you want to. You know, I can wear my tie to church. Put my jacket on, put my Bible under my shoulder, write one, King James. Walk in smiling, singing, amen. Maybe mess up on a verse or two, but just keep plugging on. And everybody think, boy, he's a happy guy and everything's going good. And the whole time my life be wicked. Amen. And so can you. But you know what that thing's going to do? It's going to eventually bring shame to your life. And the guilt will begin to overwhelm you. You can't hide it so long. And, so, and you, it'll start to tell on your life, especially if you know God. And you're out of where you ought to be with God. Hey, man, you're going to become one miserable individual. Your sin will begin to show itself. They try to cover it. You know what? You can't make yourself righteous. Amen. There ain't enough fig leaves in this world to cover it up. You know what? There ain't enough churches you can attend to cover it up. There ain't enough baptism pools to get baptized in. There ain't enough uh, 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 Bible chapters you can read to make it look good. You can't cover your sin, amen. You will not prosper, amen. Hey, what you've got to do is just stop trying to cover and just come to God, amen. Look, look, look in Romans chapter number 10. Romans 10. Of course, again, hold Genesis 3. They should have just confessed to God. They should have sought the Lord. But instead of seeking the Lord, when they saw they were wrong, they thought we'd just make it look good. Romans 10 and 1, brother, my heart's desire is Paul's desire to Israel. And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You got a desire that people be saved? Look what the Bible says the problem is. He said, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. 
In other words, they got plenty of fig leaves. They covered up their nakedness. But the Bible said, but not according to knowledge. The Bible says, why? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness are going about to establish what? Their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You know what mankind does? We'll just submit ourselves to our own righteousness. We'll do our self-righteousness. We'll, we'll, we'll change some habits, turn over a new leaf, make it better. And you can't make it better. You got to come to God and get it right. Only he can cleanse the conscience and, and give you a new life. The Bible says, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes in. And in that context, that's the same passage that we use many a times about salvation in verse 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Hey, you got to submit to God's rights and then believe in his son for forgiveness. And what is mankind doing in the early principles of sin? He's shamed about it, but he thinks, I'll just cover it up and make it work my own. And people are still doing it today. Sowing their fig leaves of, of righteousness. Trying to make it to heaven on their own. Doing their own good works and turning over new leaves. It ain't going to work. You've got to come to God. Amen. You've got to see your guilt before the Lord. They saw they were guilty, but instead of submitting, they sowed fig leaves. Self-righteousness begins to slip in. People are very self-righteous, you know. We, you know what we do? I understand I wasn't right and I done wrong, but I ain't that bad. You know, because we know somebody worse. It could have been worse. All I did was eat fruit. I could have done a lot worse. But you did do worse. You did do bad, excuse me. You disobeyed the word of God. But we saw our fig leaves. Self-righteousness slips in. You begin to trust your own good works. You know what happens? Here's what happens. Listen. Listen. When you begin to trust your own good works, when you've disobeyed the Lord and the lights came in and you realize you're not right and you start trying to cover it up, and it happens many a times, we just try to cover it up. Sooner or later, the self-righteousness and the fig leaves and the sowing and the, and, and the covering of your sin, you'll get tired of covering it. You ain't going to sow but so many leaves. And people, instead of confessing their sin and seeking the Lord, they just try to cover it and cover it, and then sooner or later they go, what, what the heck with it? That self-righteousness life will fade away soon. When people get under conviction of God and God trying to draw him to them, one of the first natural instincts of man is to clean himself up. Amen. They say, you know, things like, well, I'm going to get these things straightened out, then I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. It's just a natural reaction of the flesh. It's self-righteousness. It happened in the first uh, created beings in the earth. That first instinct was we got to make it better. But you know what? You start sowing fig leaves, you're going to get tired of sowing fig leaves. And what people do if they don't soon turn to God and repent and confess their sin and forsake it, they're going to get tired of covering it up and they're just going to let it flow. They, but so long the works of the flesh will take you. That's where you see people say, I'll just start going to church more and I'll read my Bible more and never submit to the righteousness of God. It's everything that they can do. Sooner or later, they get tired of doing it because you can't do it enough to make peace in your heart. That shame's still going to be there no matter how much you do. The only way the guilt can be removed is to turn to God and say, God, I'm guilty before you forgive me. It's guilt. You begin to trust your own good works. If sin is not soon dealt with, your good works will fade away. They'll go. <laughs> Look in Matthew 21. Remember, the, here's the example about this fig leaves, this tree. And there's several trees that are mentioned in the book of Genesis that get a lot of insight on them. That fig tree is that tree of self-righteousness. That olive tree is that tree of life. And, you know, that forbidden vine tree is that cursed fruit, amen, that God cursed. They ate of the forbidden Instead of eating of the olive and the old live, as old brother Walt Ziegler used to say, God wants to give you life, but we take death. Matthew chapter 21, Jesus was on earth walking around. Look what he says here, Matthew 21, uh, verse number 19. Matthew 21, 19. The Bible says this, verse 18, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And the Bible said in verse 19, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon but what? Leaves only. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for fruit. There was no figs. All they were was leaves. Do you know what a lot of people have today? They have leaves, but they have no fruit. 
They have the self-righteous outward things, but they don't have the fruit of the Spirit, if you will. So the Bible says, here's what Jesus said. The Bible said, he saw the fig tree in the way, came to it, and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, let no fruit go on, on thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. God cursed the self-righteous fig leaves. And God still curses self-righteousness today. God's not looking for your self-righteousness. He's looking for the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And what happens to these uh, two individuals in our, in our text? Adam and Eve, the first human beings on earth, they take of the forbidden fruit. Sin enters into their life. They die spiritually. And guilt becomes a, begins to slip in. And they try to cover their guilt with self-righteousness. You know what comes next? Fear. Guilt leads to fear. You know, what, you know what a lot of people need? A good dose of fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know what people, they don't have no fear. You know why? Because you tough, right? We tough. You know, there's something about man, he wants to be, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm tough. Talking uh, there today to Larry, he's out there coughing. I said, man, you better get in here in that cold air and you'll be getting a cough. He said, oh, I'm like you, man, I'm tough. I said, yeah, I'm tough too. Do I get sick? Then I'm a baby. <laughs> Things change. <laughs> but man's tough, right? That's, that's the stubbornness of man. That's why a lot of people die and go to hell because they tough. They ain't got no fear of God. They ain't no God going to tell me what to do. I'm my own man. Yeah, you're your own man to a certain extent. But there's a creator that made us all that we're accountable to. And mankind has lost that fear. You know, that's the motto of the day. You know, no fear. No fear. I ain't scared of nothing. You scared? I ain't scared. Yeah. Well, yeah, something will make you scared, amen. There's fear. Fear slips in. Their guilt leads to fear. Verse 8, the Bible said, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Why are they hiding? From the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Adam had enough sense about him, amen, to see something was wrong to try to make it better. But his efforts were in vain. And then he ran from God. Good thing to have a good dose of fear from God. Fear of God. He ran. And boy, you live in a world, they lost the fear of God. You know why they steal the copper out of the church and tear up the air conditions and bust out the units so they can sell it down to scrap metal and come over there and cut the Cadillac converters out to get a little bit of money down there at the scrap metal place because they ain't got no fear of God. Amen. We've lost that stuff. There used to be a day that wicked people done wickedness, but they wouldn't do it at church. Amen. They don't care where they do it now. They don't care who they do it in front of them. They're still from grandma. No fear. Next, they hide themselves. You know, you, 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 know, you don't know that God made man and we ain't no created thing from an explosion and evolution and all that garbage. The fact that you've got a consciousness, evolution didn't give you that, God did. Amen. That's a God-given factor in you, and mankind's born with it. Amen. You know what man will do? God, mom and daddy will say to that little baby, that little baby, good example, don't you do that. Don't you touch that. You know what the first thing they'll do is try to get it. And after they get it, you know the next thing they'll do is try to put it in their mouth. Just like Adam and Eve, just like their forefathers. They go put it in their mouth. And then when mom and daddy catches them with it in their mouth, you know what they do? They turn and hide. Just like they did in the beginning. They ain't nothing new. There's something in the nature of man that shows there's a God, amen. You can turn anywhere you want to turn, you see God working. You know what happened when they, when they lost their feet? They, they, they became fearful to, to the Lord. They lost their innocence and their fellowship with God. They were innocent. They were perfect. And now their fellowship is being destroyed. Self-righteous acts never takes away shame. They tried the fig leaves. You know, they saw they were naked. They showed the fig leaves. And you think, man... I don't know how long they felt good about it. How do you think? Looks good? You covered up? Yeah, you look good. And then they're sitting there and they're kind of feeling good for a moment, you know. You get a little bit of self-righteous feeling about it. And then God says, he, he comes up walking in the garden and they hear him talking. And they run and hide. Because <laughs> that shame, amen, when God shows up, amen, fear slips in and that self-righteousness shows you before the Lord, this ain't enough. And they run and hide. Look at this. Look, I found this text today. I want to show it to you. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Talking about Israel over here, Isaiah, Jeremiah. A lot of application to the church. You can make great, great application of this thought right here. 
Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, Jeremiah the prophet and the Lord speaking about the backslidden condition of Israel. And I know backsliding is, a, is an Old Testament term, and a lot of people use it today. They find some backslides, they lose their salvation and all that mess, which is heresy. But there's a principle here about shame and sin. And Israel was shameful. Sin has slipped in. The Bible said, I, uh, Jeremiah 3, look at verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me. O house of Israel, saith the Lord. God's describing their forsaking of him like a wife forsaking her husband. The Bible said in verse 21, a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way. That ain't good, right? And they have forgotten the Lord their God. And what is it bringing? Shame and weeping and supplication? It ain't good. Sin will leave you out to dry is what it will do. You know, I just do what I want to and enjoy my life. Go ahead. It'll, it'll catch up. Be sure to find you out. The Bible said, here's what, here's what God's called is, verse 22, Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslides. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly, listen to this, in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. You know that good application there? Hills, your efforts, it's going to be vain. You ain't going to do it on your own. You can climb all the hills you want. You can count all the rosary beads. You can climb all the hills and stand nail at every step. You can confess to every pope. You can join every church, read every verse of the Bible, get in every pond and creek and baptistry in the world. It's going to be vain. You ain't going to find hope in your efforts. Because look what he says. He said, he said, truly is in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame, shame have devoured the labor of our fathers for our, from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Look at this, verse 25. We lie down in our shame and, our conf and confusion covereth us. They're over there lying down, they're hiding, they're covered with their shame. Look at this, look. For we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers, from our youth even into this day, listen to what he says, and have not obeyed what? The voice of the Lord our God. That's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. They did not obey the voice of the Lord. And their guilt brought forth fear. They hiding from, they're hiding from God back in Genesis 3. And, and it's still being done today. By neglecting anything connected with God's word, people still hide from it. Hey, God, God they heard the voice of the Lord. What are they hiding from? His voice. You know what people do today? Anything connected with God's voice, they hide from it. You, you know why people don't want to pick up a Bible when they live like hell? Because it's the voice of God calling out. You know, you, know, you know why when people live like hell, they won't go down to church? Because the church is shouting forth the word of God. They preach in the book, and the voice of God is connected with church. Anything that's connected with the voice of God, we neglect and run and hide from. And that's the very thing that can get you right with God. They hide. They're running. They'll run away from the church. They'll run away from the word of God. They'll run away from godly saints. You know what's amazing about God? In the midst of all their sin and their shame, God is still compassionate. Look in verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam. God knew he had sinned. They knew they had took of the forbidden fruit. God knew they were, had sowed fig leaves. God knew they, knew they were hiding. And you know what God said? The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, What? No. He's came to war with him in the cool of the day. He wants to fellowship with him like he was when he was innocent. Man is hiding and God's saying, Come on out. The fact that God's calling out is showing the mercy of God Almighty and the compassion he has on sinners that have forsaken him. God is looking for man. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Romans 3 and 11 said there's no man that seeketh after God. We're going about doing our own wickedness, right? But while we're out there doing our wickedness and doing wrong, God's come looking for us. The God of heaven would take on the robe of flesh and walk on this old mud ball planet called earth hey, to, leak, uh, to seek out sinners that are going to hell. He's a compassionate God. The first question you find in the Bible that God gave to man is, where art thou? 
It's amazing. You look over to the New Testament, the first question given over there in Luke, Matthew chapter number 2 is, where is he that's born king of the Jews? <laughs> God's looking for man, and the answer and the hope for man is the king of the Jews. This question shows God's grace. Remember Jude, chapter, Jude, Jude verse 6, chapter 6, only one chapter in Jude. Verse number 6, you know what the Bible says? That God chained up those angels that left their first estate. God created those angels perfect, and they followed the devil, and done what they did. You know what God done to them? He punished them. Here's mankind showing up on earth, disobeys the word of God. I'd say he's pretty compassionate. He didn't chain them all up in hell and say to heck with them and start again. You don't thank God's mercy? You better thank God we don't get what we deserve. Those angels that left their first estate, they got punishment. Mankind left his walk with God, and God was compassionate and said, hey, where are you? You tell me God don't love man. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You better get a hold of that truth. You say, oh, nobody loves me. Man, if you wasn't loved by God, you'd be in hell tonight. Amen. The old preachers used to say, man, we deserve to be in hell with our back broke. You say, not me, preacher. I'm not that bad. That's your problem. God's compassionate. He came looking for them. Thank God we don't get what we deserve. Now, could I say, you know, God said, where art thou? You know, that's not saying that God's overlooking sin. Amen. He wouldn't be a just God if he'd done that. God never overlooks sin. That's why there's death that shows on later on in this chapter, amen, there's blood shed and, and the covering of them with the, with the skin of an animal. Something has to die for sin to be taken care of. God's not overlooking sin. This call is a call of justice because God's a just God. It's a call of sorrow. Because he's a compassionate God. And it's a call of love. Where art thou? 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. Amen. You tell me nobody loves you. You've been mistaken. There's a God in heaven that loves you. Just as he loved Adam and Eve. He's still looking. You know what he says? Where art thou? Where art thou? Where am I, preacher? Yeah, where are you in the sight of God? Guilt. Guilt brought fear, and, and then fear led to them blaming. Verse 10 through 13. The Bible said in verse 10, God said, Where art thou? Here's what he said when he shows up, verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. You know what you see in verse number 10? Honesty. Now, it's only honesty to a certain extent. And that's the way we are, you know. We'll be honest to a certain extent. Did he hear the voice of the Lord? Yeah. Look at verse 10. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. Honest. I was afraid. Honest. Because I was naked. Honest. I hid myself. You know what you see the problem in verse 10 is? It's still the problem today. I, I heard you. I was fearful. I hid myself. That's honesty, amen. The problem is us. You know what we like to do? Well, if I'd have been raised better, mom and daddy wouldn't have been like that. If I'd have been dealt a better card, you know what, truth be not, you know, you know, I was raised in a busted home. Busted home. Raised by my father. My brother was. Our mother left when we was young. We know her today, see her today, thank God for it, you know, make the best of what you got. But you know what? It ain't my mama's fault I lived like hell and that she left. You know why I done that? Because that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't my fact that my daddy wasn't around to be a compassionate father and all he did was work to give us something to eat and put uh, the piece of clothes on our back. I, I'd done what I wanted to do because I wanted to gratify my flesh. Amen. You know what you did? You done what you wanted to do because that's what you wanted to do. Right. And the sooner you get honest about it, the sooner you can get help from God. Amen. Stop blaming everybody else. Well, it's the government's fault. It ain't the government's fault. It's the president's fault. If you think it ain't his fault. <laughs> It ain't the teacher's fault, the police's fault. It's our fault. We're the problem. He was honest. Verse 11 says, and he said, who told thee thou was naked? Okay, who told you that? He goes on to say, God says, has thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? God said two questions. Who told you? Did you eat what you shouldn't have? 
God knew who told, God knew who told him everything. God knew he had already ate. God knew where he was hiding. You know what God wants him to do? God just wants him to own it. God wants him to own up to his sin. God has given Adam an, an opportunity, a chance to confess it. Remember Proverbs? Whosoever covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh, he shall find mercy. You know what God's doing when he said, who told you, man? Did you eat what you shouldn't have ate? You know what God's saying? Here's your chance. Here's your opportunity. All Adam had to say is, Lord, I did it. Lord, I, I, I didn't listen. There's the, op you know, that, boy, you tell me God is not merciful. He opens up his arms of opportunity. He's giving him a chance. But instead, what is man's natural instincts? His sin, sorrow has brought his guilt, has brought him fear, and now it shows forth in the blame game. Pass the buck. Instead of confessing, his instincts, uh, his natural uh, instincts of old, the old nature, the old man blames somebody else. Verse 12, instead of confessing, when God gave him the chance, the man said, the woman which thou gavest to me, it's her fault, and by the way, Lord, if you wouldn't have given her to me, we wouldn't be here. Well, that's really bold, ain't it? It's really bold. People say, you know what? If Adam and Eve wouldn't have done what they did, so you mean tell me God should have never put them in the garden? God should have never gave them a free will to make a choice? You know what you're doing? You're sticking your finger out at God and saying he's the fault, problem. That's mighty bold, ain't it, big boy? You better watch it. Confessing would have been the answer, but instead they blame. They blame one another, and they blame God. Well, Adam blames her. She blames the devil. He said, and I did eat. Instead of confessing, they began to make excuses. Well, ain't that how we do it? You got to make it look good. But in order to help it, good dose of confession. When you get like that and you've sinned and sin has brought forth the shame and now there's guilt and there's fear, what better way to make it look good than just say it's somebody else's fault? You know why people's life go downwardly? Because when sin is, shame comes in, and instead of confessing and getting right with God, you point the finger at somebody else. They blame. You remember, remember when he, Luke chapter 14, verse 17 through 20, when he sent out those men to go out and get somebody to come because the marriage supper is ready, and they begin to make excuse? I bought some oxen, you know, got to go prove, bought some land. The last guy said, hey, man, I got married. <laughs> That's a good one, ain't it? They've got a new freshly married couple back. I'm sure they wouldn't say that, amen? But we like to make excuses. We like to blame. And instead of coming to the invitation that God offers, man prefers his own gratification over accepting God's invitation. That's what they chose. I've got some oxen, proving them. Got some land. Got a it's his, it's, the, the bottom line is it's his gratification. It's what he wants. Instead of coming to the invitation of God, now I'm pretty happy what I got. You know why people die and go to hell? Because you know what? I'm happy where I'm at. I'm okay. They said people like that. I understand, you know, God and all that stuff, but you know what? I'm good. They choose their own gratification over God. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain, his, gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And the Bible says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what he exchanged? His own gratification. I don't need God. I got everything I want. What a sad choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. And the shame has entered in. You know what they should have said? Let me close with this. Look in Psalms 51. David over here. This is what should have been done. Psalms 51. When you get like that and sin comes in, and it's liable to happen to anybody, anybody in here. And it'll bring that guilt and it'll bring that fear. But instead of blaming, you know what would be good? To do exactly what David did right here. 
Look at these verses. I'll just read them to you. This is what they should have said. Something around this fashion. David said, At their sin with Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet had pointed his finger at him and let him know that he was the man, thou art the man. This is one of David's confessions. He says in Psalms 51.1, Have mercy upon me, O God. I believe God would like to hear that. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. He said, for I acknowledge my transgressions. Here's the truth, whether you want to admit it or not, and my sin is ever before me. You get to doing wrong, that guilt, that it was ever before me. You get to living like hell, it just seems like it just shows up at night on the bed. And you think about it, you can't sleep. That's the way David was. It's ever before him. He's guilty. Look what he says, verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Sin brings shame. The guilt leads to hiding, which eventually turns to blaming. If you're here and you need some help, God's wanting to help. He's a forgiving God. He'll blot it out and take it away. There needs to be some confession and forsaking. And God will re restore that peace back in your heart. What a sad story of Adam and Eve. But what truths we can learn that could help our lives. Forsake the sin. Ask God to help you with the shame. as we'll see next it's going to lead to sorrow there's a price to pay that's why I'm glad the Savior paid it for us the lost sinner can turn to God and be saved and God can give him back that spirit of life and the saint of God can find help in this journey below It'll do us all good to take, keep a short account with the Lord. What many people are doing are continually adding to the list. The devil will get you to the point in your life where the conscience is seared and you'll say, well, I've already gone this far. What's the use? Why don't I go a little further? That devil's out to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't you let him have no more. Let him help you. Amen. Everyone stand.